Good morning. You're listening to Drinking Socially, the official untapped podcast. Your weekly look into what's happening in the untapped community and the world of beer. This episode is brought to you by Untapped and the Untapped Merch Store. Use the coupon code PODCAST to get 20% off your next purchase. I'm Harrison, and today we're going to drink a beer from the City of Rocks, or Music City USA, more formally the Minneapolis of the South. Of course, I'm talking about Nashville, Tennessee. Super excited about it. Uh, We're also going to ask a slippery, would you rather learn about another hop and maybe even deep dive into some deep thoughts. But first, as always, a beer. John, what do we have? I'm excited about this one, man. I'm doing a bad job showing it off to the camera for YouTube. But (laughs) this is Homestyle from Tennessee's maybe most celebrated brewery, Bearded Iris, um, out of Nashville, Tennessee. Harrison, did you say the City of Rocks? City of Rocks, like All rocks right. on the ground, not like rock and roll, I don't think. That was coined in 1880, so I don't think rock and roll was You're right. not a thing. But rocks definitely were a thing. They knew what was coming in Nashville, and now Bearded <laughs> Iris, uh, nationally, internationally, I've seen Bearded Iris celebrated in, in Sweden uh, at beer festivals. So their uh, most famous IPA, they refer to as Homestyle, just got released in North Carolina. It's a New England style IPA, but it comes out at 6%. Um, they don't publish an IBU, but a little bit of notes we found were this is a single hopped with mosaic, which I'm yep. a huge fan of. And they do use, uh, from what I can tell, a good amount of oats in this beer, which will hopefully provide some kind of soft and juicy citrus flavors. Mosaic sometimes hits me like blueberry, and otherwise it tastes like bubblegum uh harrison i see you digging into it how's that first sip hitting you oh man <laughs> it really is like a liquid blueberry it's the nose for it's you know it's one of those beers right i opened the can up and you may have heard me kind of trying to stifle my giggles as i was like oh boy i know where this is going mosaic is such an awesome hop and you're right like straight like hard blueberries it's almost with a residual sweetness, like blue, like someone like just baked a blueberry pie right next to me is what's happening. Like it's the sweetness too of a pie, a blueberry pie, and even the kind of right crackeriness of a blueberry pie crust. It's without it being jammy or anything, obviously, but it's oh, this is a blueberry all the way. What about you, John? What are you? What's happening over there? Yeah. So the uh, the aroma carries for me sometimes that kind of uh hard to distinguish mosaic like i don't know if i'm smelling blueberries or even like a strawberry right Right. the aroma was almost sweet and i got a little bit of that bubble gum on Mm. the nose but as soon as i took a sip it's it's got blueberry like which isn't the sweetest berry it has a little bit of bitterness to it for me and, and it's uh i i can understand why this beer is so popular we, I know, I remember asking Harrison to try and figure out where the name comes from. And after listening to his first sip, I'm thinking home style, like a homemade blueberry pie. That's there you go. probably wrong. Um, <laughs> but this is the first New England style we've had on the podcast for a little while, Harrison. Yeah, that's right. And since, uh, since we started doing this kind of BJCP style guideline and New England IPAs are prolific in the U.S., worldwide, certainly on Untapped. I'm yeah. excited to hear you give us kind of a breakdown on the style guides for New England IPA. For sure. Yep, so uh, BDCP, this is uh, style number 21B, a specialty IPA, uh, and the sub kind of category would be New England IPA. And so overall, uh, they're saying it's an American IPA with intense fruit flavors and aromas, a soft body, Smooth mouthfeel and often opaque uh, with substantial haze. So all of that is happening so far. Less perceived bitterness than traditional IPAs, but always massively hop forward. Uh, The emphasis on late hopping, especially dry hopping, with hops with uh, tropical fruit qualities lends the specific juicy character for which this style is known. So right away, Homestyle is checking a lot of boxes. The juicy, obviously the haze, this thing is extremely 
hazy. Although it's not, you know, there's even like levels of haze now. Like, you know, this is not uh, True. fresh squeeze orange juice. This has got a great haze to it, though. It's definitely opaque and, um, and the, you know, the oats will do that. Um, but no lactose or anything like, like that to really make it super thick isn't necessary. Um, and then, yeah, the fruit, juicy, fruity, fruit floor forward. I mean, we both said that we got a lot of berries out of the nose and the, the first sips of this guy. So, so far following kind of right in line with, uh, with New England. And we've talked about this before on the podcast about how kind of this style. So BDCP obviously is that correct. Is that traditionally a New England style IPA had way less perceived bitterness. It was dialed down the IBUs big time where the hops are used mostly late in the boil and in dry hopping, which doesn't impart bitterness to the beer. And this is that, I mean, this is a more traditional, I would say New England style IPA because it's not very bitter, but it is extremely hop forward. However, as we spoke about in the podcast before recently, there's kind of a lot of like kind of playing with that where you get a lot of hazy IPAs that are really bitter and then also really fruit forward or ones that are like really bitter and piney and hazy. So there's a lot of kind of stuff happening with the haze right now, which is a lot of fun to experience. But when you think about the first million IPAs, they were way less bitter and home style is that it definitely kind of reminds me of, of what I, the first doing on IPAs I ever had. Totally, totally agreed. There's a brewery on the East coast uh, who I know you're familiar with the veil and mm. uh, they, I remember right. going to their tap room a while ago and they were touting zero IBU yep. uh, New England style IPAs, yep. which sure. I, I don't know if that technically qualifies as a New England style with no right. IBU, right. but uh, but that's a testament to maybe marketing. The beers were, the beers were memorably different. I think yeah. the Vale's pretty talented. And am I correct in assuming after these going through these beer one on ones with you, Harrison, that means there was uh, little to almost no hops added in the boil to get to get rid of that, or or maybe there's other math that's involved. But yeah, I mean that's it, right? Like the yeah, the, you, you, you're just not adding many or any hops early on in the boil. I mean I've seen and brewed New England IPAs where we, the the hop additions start at that kind of. 20 minute mark, 20 minutes to the end of the boil or 15 minutes to the end. And that's usually you start right at the beginning, um, you know, to actually impart the bitterness and give it the time needed in the kettle to, um, as we've said, kind of change those um, bittering, uh, the hops, the alpha acids into iso alpha acids. They're actually getting some of that bitterness on uh, and experiencing it and able to able to perceive it. So um, yeah, it's, it's all about when you add those hops uh, absolutely. Um, I'm adding some more to my glass right I know. now. I, I, I love the 16 ounce can. This one, I know, this right? one's gonna, it's going down a little bit slower than the Oktoberfest beer we drank on the last episode though. Fair enough. Um, and I know you said you had a little, a little, uh, what time killer, something to talk about, uh, as we sip on this beer a little oh, bit early on. Yes. Right, John. So we have a good old fashioned, would you rather, to sink our teeth into today as we enjoy uh, this beverage. It's a doozy. It's 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 really kind of, I think, right in our wheelhouse where we're, no rules, no guidelines, not even beer specific, other than we're drinking beers and our answers are perhaps inspired by that. Um, just a, a good old-fashioned would you rather. So this week we're going to tackle the age-old question of would you rather be bitten by a snake or eat a snake alive? John, thoughts? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I've gotten kind of used to doing these and keeping them beer related. There's no beer in this in this question. Yeah, there could be. Um, I mean, <laughs> it may influence my response. Yep. Um, so there's a big qualifier in this for me. If it's, it, there's garter snakes, right? That I nope. grew up, they were all over and I, yeah, they could bite me all day long. But if you won't answer that question for me, then I have the possibility <laughs> that this, uh, this snake bite could be the end of a really long day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm going to say you don't know. I'm going to say even better than that. You don't know if it's venomous or not. Ooh, you ooh. don't know. 
Okay, so as a as a risk mitigator, I think is <laughs> is is what my my wife lovingly refers to me as. Oh. Um, if I stick my hand into that bag, not knowing what type of snake is in there, and accept a bite, I assume am I am I like on the Joe Rogan show where they've got anti venom just in case? No, I'm eating the snake. <laughs> Uh, between the two, oh, really? between the two choices oh. you're giving me, I don't think it'll hurt me as much to eat a snake as it would to risk a snake bite. And it's just a strict mathematic equation at that point, which yeah. one's going to possibly hurt me less. So I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to eat a snake and I am not promising success with that. It is going to be a long battle sure. that I probably yeah. fail. And yeah. then I end up getting bit anyway. I was going to say, right. The downside <laughs> of that is maybe you're, it bites you while you're eating it. And then, right. You've kind of, you've, you've, you're burning the candle at both ends at that point. It's just a. Uh, you can't even win that battle. You get to eat it, and then you just die. Maybe <laughs> I assume this was one you came up with like halfway through this uh, this four pack of bearded iris uh, mm-hmm. as you were as you were coming up with some of the topics for the show. And I'm really curious. I want to know what prompted it, but more so, I want to know your answer. Harrison, you've Mm -hmm. adorned us on YouTube with many heavy metal shirts. I know you're a pretty big fan of all the music that I regard as cool. (laughs) I I have to, I have to assume the natural answer is to just eat the snake. It's an opportunity to join a rock band. Right. Um, What what are your thoughts behind it? To one up uh, Ozzy Osbourne and the eating of the bat. (laughs) Um, You know, I mean, right. It's it. This one gave me pause. It was more about, and, and you know, Right, it's like, do I, man, I mean, okay, bitten by a snake, even if it's not poisonous, snakes' mouths are like, that's a big kind of misnomer or misconception about snakes is even the non-poisonous ones, they got dirty mouths, you're going to get, you need to go to the hospital. If you get bitten by a snake, go to the hospital, it's going to be infected, you need to get some kind of antiseptic in there. Um, So venomous or not, not a good time um, to be bit by one, period. However... I mean, right, like, uh, there's a little bit of me. I hope I'm not opening up Pandora's box, not to talk more about whatever. Here we go. Uh, scary things. But, like, there's a small part of me that wonders what that ex- what happens, what that experience is like. You go to the hospital or whatever, you buy a snake, and they got to give you antivenom. I'm sure it's not just any venom maybe there's uh some like uh, volume you also get to calm you down or <laughs> some really intense benadryl and it then depends <laughs> in the states you're just gonna die in the waiting room <laughs> but <laughs> right we'll get to you take a number um but uh right so like that that has me curious the actual experience of like i'm bitten by a snake someone please help me um and but not not <laughs> not curious enough to volunteer myself to do it we almost had a snake get in our house the other week not to totally derail this that was a fun afternoon of walking out to the grill to grill some chicken all of a sudden the dogs are barking like crazy i turn the corner and there's a big rat snake which are not poisonous and kind of dumb uh, but big um uh co- coiled up and the dogs have him in a corner and he's trying to escape into the door to the house and i'm like standing there like chicken on the grill what's happening are the dogs going to get eaten by this snake are they going to eat the snake have they already been bitten <laughs> I'm just trying to quickly get through lunch here. And I was able to grab a lacrosse stick and shuttle it into the front of the house. But, um, so that was exciting. But so yeah, snakes, but an eating one, you it's imagine that's gotta be like the battle of the century where it's going to try and climb out of your mouth or that. I don't know if I could deal with that. I, the sensation of like, Oh, man, you're making me want to change my I, mind. I just, I, I feel like the wiggling and the, I would just, I w- wish I'd be dead by that point. And so then, okay, take the snake bite and maybe you live, maybe you don't. That's also the ultimate kind of, right, like, you know, sweet dude move of like, give me the bite without even, the, I should have just gone, give me the bite and said nothing and just drop the mic. But I'm, it's too, that's past. I can't recover. I already am <laughs> wishing I would have said that too. Um, <laughs> Give I mean, me it's, it's, as I think about eating the snake, it's, <laughs> it's, it takes right. me a couple minutes to get through like a proper hoagie. 
this yeah, isn't gonna right if, if i value around, my own right. time it's worth it to just <laughs> right, take the snake bitten. bite and hope for the takes a benadryl right and just um, kind of hope it moves along yeah, or suck the poison uh, out like it's that's that's what i'm sure a cowboy would do like, yeah or he would just like right he's been bitten by so many snakes at that point you're probably immune that's it. The long con is just start taking small doses of poison now so that when this happens, you're like, ha not me. I knew a guy who tried to become immune to poison ivy that way. Did not work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you finish the story there, everybody. Oh, man. Um, yeah, a it's lot hard of winners to out there. Immune to poison ivy. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't have any advice for that. Just stay away from it. <laughs> Yeah. It's probably, I, I just had it a, a, like a couple of weeks ago, though. It's unpleasant. Even at 37 years old, it's still yeah. just as bad as it was when you right. were 12. It's also mentally defeating. Like, I got beaten by a plant. A plant a plant yeah. snuck up to me and somehow <laughs> overcame the clothes I was wearing. And, yeah, I know all that. Yep. Yeah, I know. It's not. We have it growing all over our house. And I just look at it and say, next weekend. I'll get rid of that next weekend. Yep, let's stay and inside. Here we are. <laughs> growing by the second but um, i think i think i'll land on getting bit by the snake whatever well and i'll just ride that uh ride that that roulette wheel and see where it lands for the record if the fates are listening i, I think i'm gonna align with harrison on that one i'll oh i'll take a snake happened? bite over right. being for, uh, oh that's a tough would you rather man that brings <laughs> it back to like this is like the third beer would you rather where right. we're not on the air and we're exactly. actually really drinking dive, beer right. together we're quietly googling, right googling how yeah. many poisonous snakes are in north carolina and yeah. trying to look at their habitat and building maps and charts well uh, statistically yep yeah if I can map it, I'm I'm confident making a decision. Um, here's a segue, which is one of my favorite parts about Untapped. Um, right. Well, Segways. sort of. I don't really use Untapped ratings to make a decision on the beer I drink. I want to drink all of it. Ratings. Mm. If 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 I have to choose between one or two, you know, I might look and see what my friends thought. But let's get into the ratings on Bearded Iris's home style. So this beer has been checked in almost 80,000 times, um, which is pretty good considering that for most of its life, it's just been in and around Nashville, Tennessee. And on Untapped, Harrison, it carries an overall rating of 4.04. Anything above four is basically perfection. Yeah. Um, over over 80,000 different opinions, which is amazing. Yep. And... Um, for recipe, we don't have a lot to go on, but we know it's a single hop with mosaic, uh, and they do add oats to it. One of the things I encountered uh, trying to research this beer a little bit, uh, really excited that it was coming to North Carolina, but yeah. the team at Bearded Iris, uh, if you look, a lot of their brewers have done a couple of kind of quick interviews about, you know, how do we come up with a name for this beer or the recipe in some cases, and this beer specifically, um, when it, during inception, as I read the interview, um, they had traveled to Pacific Northwest and talked to, as Harrison will talk about many mm. times in his hop conversations, the top hop spot. Uh, they went and visited uh, the hop farmer and looked at not just mosaic hops, but kind of individually, almost like you go to a farmer's market oh, yeah. and we're looking for the specific mosaic hop that kind of was singing these blueberry, strawberry notes. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, all right, cool. This is going to be the hop that we make the beer after. And what I love and respect Bearded Iris for so much is that, you know, the hops are going to change. Right now, the Pacific Northwest is uh, in a really rough place for hop farmers. Mm -hmm. So things are going to change that require nature to, to grow them. And Bearded Iris is okay with that, right? Every time they brew this beer, they're looking for maybe what hop brings those characteristics even more to the table. Um, or if it's not quite home style worthy of Mosaic, then it might go into a different beer. And I think that's just like, we talk about that sometimes in Beer 101. Like that's, I, I give so much respect to a brewer or a chef or somebody that can just take the ingredients they have and make them not just make them work to finish home style, 
would give them an opportunity to be the best mosaic hops they can be. Now I sound yeah. like a kindergarten teacher, but <laughs> but you're right. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely, John. Yeah, I mean that's a big part of the brewing pro or yeah, owning a brewery, running a successful brewery is having a relationship with these hop farmers. And yeah, it's not like you right you go to the store and you grab a box of mosaic off the shelf and it's always going to taste the same. It's where it's grown on the field, the hop farm, the kind of conditions that year. Like there's so many, again, terroir, as you spoke about uh, a couple episodes ago, I believe. Um, it, it's it's real and it changes season to season. And um, and yeah, so that's a big thing that right now is we're kind of sitting in the uh, harvest, the hop harvest season brewers are doing currently. I mean, I'm sure if you follow any of your favorite breweries on Instagram or Facebook or whatever you've seen, as I have a lot of them posting pictures now of that selection process. And it's a little bit different this year where a lot of those farmers are sending hops out to the brewers because they can't make the trip. Um, and they're kind of doing that selection process at the brewery with some samples that have been been sent out. So it's still happening. I mean, they'll send out, you know, 20 different versions of Cascade. You smell them, feel them, taste them, do whatever, and decide, all right, just batch this number from this field. We want, you know, 10,000 pounds of that. And that's, that's great. That's how it kind of works. And so kind of one of the things I wanted to get into on this episode, Harrison, was the DDH, right? The double mm. dry hop, which is generally, I think, if you go into a craft beer bar and, and you say double dry hop, the rest is implied. Um, this beer specifically, like Bearded Iris doesn't actually say if it's double dry hopped or yeah. not. But when I drink it and you get that kind of fruit aroma, mm and an explosion of berry, you th I, I equate that. Like, oh, this is probably double dry hopped, which almost in my head means New England. So I wanted to ask Harrison uh, kind of two quick questions individually. One, what is double dry hop? What does that mean if you're right. a brewer and you're coming in and that's in the recipe? What is it, what, why is it, why is it so, what is it? Popular, yeah, right, right, what is it? So. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, the, the name really says a lot, although there's some confusion. So to be clear, that means you are, it doesn't mean you're dry hopping with two different hops or anything like that. The double is referring to two different dry hopping sessions, I guess you could call it. So, um, two different dry hop drops is what we would, would call it. So you're say on like day three of fermentation, going up to the top of the fermenter, and dropping in a bunch of hops into that beer, sealing it off, uh, then waiting a day or two, usually pulling those beers then that have dropped out of the suspension out of the bottom of the beer, perhaps waiting a day or two more, and then doing the same thing again, dropping in more hops, let them sit there, drop them out, uh, and then move them on to kind of packaging. And that's, um, yeah, so that, that's what it means. It means you're dry hopping the beer twice. Uh, and it can be... With the same hops each time, different hops each time. That's just preference, whatever the brewery wants to do. And so we talked about a little bit on Beer 101, whether it be the episode about hops or the brew day, like how the later you add hops to your beer, the you're not getting the bitterness, but you're getting more the aroma or the flavor of these hops sometimes. And, and in this case, dry hopping happening so late is... Uh, giving you that's where the blueberry that's why I can taste the mosaic blueberry in this rather than any mosaic bitterness that would have probably come in from the boil mm -hmm. um, so here's a, a speculation question Harrison why do you think double dry hop has become so iconic in craft beer over the last couple of years obviously I'm not asking you to answer this you know like in front of Congress but right why do you <laughs> think it, it's made such a popular beer style or trend sure so I think there are a couple of different factors and it, you could go down the rabbit hole of like who did it first and all that stuff and it's kind of like it's almost like um it was inevitable this happened meaning it kind of started with hop back and torpedo machines that like Trogues and Sierra Nevada. And even before that anchor brewing, were using to do something similar where they would send their beer through a bunch of fresh hops in a separate vessel and then send it back into their, into the tanks and let it keep, you know, conditioning. 
Um, and then someone's like, all right, instead of doing that, maybe it's more effective if this is for aroma to drop it in the actual tank itself. We'll let it sit there for a couple of days. Let's try that. So lots like iterations. And again, no idea like who did it first or landed on. This is the kind of the way to do it and, and dry hop. But it started to take off in popularity. New England's had a lot to do with it as New England um, IPAs grew in popularity so easily did the the growth of double dry hops because and, and really it, this is where kind of um, I guess logistics come into play of right so now you have this beer that you added almost no hops to boil in you added some hops right at the end of the, the kettle but what can you do to make this beer more complex what can you do to make it taste fresher taste like a hop right off the vine well let's dry hop it okay why can we take that to the next level maybe we dry hop twice and I have no idea again like where who had that thought first or whatever, but um, kind of the thought being like, right, let's try and get fresh hops in here as close to packaging this beer as you kind of logistically can without it looking like we're packaging pond water uh, and because it's just full of hop particulate. And I think that's like the, the big part that not a lot of people talk about is that the reason that double dry hopping is so popular compared to single or triple is that like the average um, time and IPA is going to spend in a tank after fermentation kind of conditioning would before it cold crashes and is transferred it kind of it's like the perfect amount of time to allow for two separate dry hops or really wouldn't be enough time for three and with one, well, you have more time. Why not do another? So there's again, like That's kind good. of a lo- like a logistical approach to it. As a brewer, you're like, okay, this needs to be packaged in 18 days. What can I do in that time? Yeah. Well, I could dry hop it, and actually, I could probably dry hop it again before I have to cold crash this thing and get it packaged, and it would still look clear enough to you know be servable. So I think it's just kind of like, and there are plenty of places to do triple dry hops and quadruple dry hops and all that stuff, and. Also, at that point, you're kind of getting it gets very. I think it gets very vegetative, and it's almost too much. Double dry hopped beers seem to like be that sweet spot of it's. It tastes like you're drinking a liquid hop, but not but not tasting hoppy material, and and that's tough. It's a line that a lot some brewers are better than others of kind of dancing along, where it tastes very flavorful, but it doesn't feel like you're drinking a salad, and it's kind of what we talked about before hop burn totally. kind of just, like just there's too much material in there too many just unprocessed pop oils that you're like tongue is trying to deal with for it to really be enjoyable and it uh, can, completely it can get really scientific as you've kind of alluded to even uh, like the series beer 101 has sometimes crossed the threshold into a little bit more <laughs> oh, advanced man. But even it's not just as simple as throwing some hops into the fermenter and hoping for the best. So there's temperature considerations. There's yes. like molecular science that's happening oh during gosh. all this, which yeah. is kind of a t- like when you see breweries that that are really celebrated, like Treehouse, right? Like they have their system dialed in so well that they're able to kind of replicate the taste they like, which sure. a lot of people also agree with. Yeah. And that's a, I mean, that's a bit trial and error too. I mean, the, the, there's a term hop geyser, uh, which is a real term, uh, which was somebody found this out the hard way and many assistant brewers and new brewers still learn it <laughs> today. It's probably happening right now somewhere where, as John said, if you don't bring the temperature up of that beer before you dry hop it to above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is our kind of sweet spot, um, the beer is going to be too, it would usually at that point be cold and we'd have to bring it up to 60 degrees to dry hop. If it was any colder, there would be so much CO2 from the fermentation trapped in suspension of that beer because CO2 will stay in liquid longer when it's colder than when you added like a room temperature or a not as cold huge dose at once, like dumped in a bunch of hops. It would create nucleation points basically around those hops yeah. that would that would force that CO2 out of the beer and take a lot of the beer with it. So there are plenty, if you Google cop geyser online, it's you'll just see pictures of brewers covered in green mud, it looks like, or a, a, a tank <laughs> that's covered in a green avalanche of someone who, right, didn't raise that temperature enough and dropped in hops and it was too cold and 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 got just a face full of hoppy grossness. And uh, 
Yeah, that's a bummer for many reasons. You're cleaning up. You lost a lot of beer. First time it happens, you're probably really confused because it happens instantly. I've seen it almost happen a couple times where you can hear the gas whistling because it's starting to build up. Some CO2 starting to kick out, and you just know, like, no, stop what you're doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, before it just becomes a mess. But um, So but yeah. popular, but potentially messy right. or maybe right. just educational hopefully sure. it's one of those things that <laughs> sounds like it happens pretty frequently yeah. um and maybe you can learn and adapt right um, yeah. i want to transition because we're i, I don't want to keep you guys too late um a real quick update from the untapped news and media team we're getting closer to Ooh. october 24th uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. on October 24th, please, if you're Ooh. listening to this, you're already invited yeah. to come celebrate with us. Come hang out. Take your shoes off. Take your socks off. Put them up on the coffee table. Um, no, don't do that. You'll get in trouble. Uh, but seriously, <laughs> come celebrate with us. Harrison and I are going to be there. Greg Avola, the founder of Untapped, is going to be there on October 24th. We're inviting you guys to come drink and celebrate with us at our 10th anniversary party. Uh, enjoy a beer. We're going to be walking pretty much through Untapped's 10 years. There's going to be giveaways. There's going to be some uh, special edition Untapped merch and a really, really exciting badge competition that we're unveiling as well as some music, some collaboration, beer tastings and more. But the hope is uh, one of you lucky folks is going to be able to create a, a badge for untapped, which has never happened before. Um, and some pretty amazing breweries that are participating in this kind of collaboration beer recipe we've got going, which will be a, a locally fruited kettle sour. I saw froth from Buffalo, New York on there is going to be representing my hometown. Harrison, any, any breweries participate? Do you notice every day? It feels like a new one gets added where I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. But with a veil jumped on and I was like, Oh, there's slushy kind of <sighs> program already with our uh, sour, you know, like they're already doing so well with that. I'd love to see what they do with this recipe and, and kind of if they slush it up or not. But that was that was immediately exciting. So, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, and also just overall amazing to see how many different countries and regions are being represented and want to kind of get on this party. So, again, if you haven't checked out the website yet, um, the address, what is it? It's just untap.com slash 10. Slash one zero. Slash one zero. Go there, follow along, find your local brewery. If it's not on there, next time you're there grabbing some beer, say, hey, are you guys making this? Um, and uh, yeah, we can't wait to see you guys on uh, the 24th. It'll be fun. John and I are getting to some some trouble online. There'll be some cool guests. It'll be, yeah, it'll be, it'll be fun. It will be fun and we'll definitely be drinking. And, um, <laughs> That'll, that'll that'll make that'll help. Uh, <laughs> not that we're encouraging drinking to have fun. Sure. So Harrison, Never. covering dry hop, double dry hop, mosaic yep. hops early on in the show. Yeah. I'm. I know we got to wrap up, and you've been doing this top hop spot covering the sea hops. Yes. I'm excited to hear what you've got on deck. This is one of the this is one of the hops that kind of made me start realizing how important they were in beers uh, yeah. when I started to see this name come around. So I'm going to sit yeah. back and drink this beer while you educate me. Perfect. So today we're doing Citra hops. Yay. So Citra is, <laughs> I mean, it's one of those hops that's got such a, uh, now it's got, I guess you could say a lore behind it or something as some kind of, right. It's someone says Citra hops and immediately my attention has been grabbed. Okay. Tell me more. I want to try that beer. Um, and you know, home style or drinking, there is a double dry hopped citra with citra version of this beer. Not the one we had today, but it's out there. So, um, Beer to Dyer is very familiar with this hop, as are many breweries now. But quick history uh, it was designed as an American aroma hop, um, uh, first released in 2008 to the brewing world and actually used commercially uh, at scale. And it's really become like, again, like the most one of the most coveted uh, aroma hops out there. Um, really complex lineage too. It's cool that uh, Hellertal Mittenfru is like the father hop with Tetanang and then like Brewer's Gold and East Kent Golding um, being part of the lineage as well. So a lot of really classic hops 
from yeah, all over Europe really cool. and the UK, right? Um, contributing, partially contributing to this. The profile of the Citra Hop when it comes to the flavor, it's 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 obviously, I mean, citrus, citra, citrus flavors, but also you can get peach, apricot, passion fruit out of it. I've had them be lemony and melony before, but overall kind of a tropical fl- fruit aroma. Um, exchangeable or somewhat similar hops. You see the Cascade and Centennial again because that grapefruit kind of connection, but also actually... Uh, some brewers can swap out mosaic, although that tends to be more, as we've said, blueberry forward, even Simcoe sometimes, which can be a little more dank, but, uh, definitely brings the grapefruit, uh, with it when it, wherever it goes, Citra does. And, uh, popular beers with that showcase this beer is Pseudo Sue yep. from Toppling Goliath. Um, Three Floyd Zombie Dust has a lot of Citra in it. Mains Beers, uh, Dinner, their double IPA. Focal Banger from The Alchemist. They're a ton. It was, I mean, They're already I remember, a great right, list. Right. What right? a list, right? But I, I remember when it came, you know, onto the scene. I was brewing in Philly. I was at Philly Beer Week, and like it felt like every uh, cask or firkin that I had from some limited release from a brewery had citrus in it. And I was like, whoa, this is going to be the next thing. And I mean, I think it's safe to say it definitely was and still is one of those hops everyone kind of freaks out about. It's absolutely delicious. So, um, there you have it, Citra. You can check out the blog. I'm gonna, I'll post more about it there. Add some more beers, some check-ins, all that cool stuff that uh, showcase Citra. But it's a great one. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys check it in, check in beers with it. Uh, tag me in it if you want. If you have one you really like, um, uh, Citra, throw a tag on there, and I'll check it out too. Cool. Oh, man. All right. So let me see. Okay, good. All right. So let's just uh, as we wrap up here. We want to, again, we're kind of doing a, a quick little pause. I know we're running running on time, but um, at the end of these shows to just gather our thoughts, think about something else as we've had a, a beverage and perhaps are opening our mind to new ideas and possibilities. Um, <laughs> thanks to that. Uh, I have, <laughs> I have a, a deep dive question for John uh, today. Get his thoughts on, uh, on something we probably all think about. Uh, so, John, uh, when you're stressed out, what is your go-to activity? What do you do to help relieve that? Honestly, I probably put on some music and sit there and get consumed by what's stressing me out. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's, um, that's, 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 that's step one. Um, yep. But I think it is sure. something, especially over the last couple of months, you know, uh, everybody's living their lives differently than they planned. And... When I am stressed out, it's it's hard for me to focus on anything else. What usually what I what if it bothers me long enough, where where I can find some kind of like my fortress of solitude mm. is uh, drawing uh, something simple yeah. like a a, a a microphone holder for the podcast or a six pack holder for beer, and going out into my garage and just making it out of wood and having something to zone in on. So. That's a that's a deep, good question. Stress is rough, man. Yep. It's you know it's it's a it can be a motivator, it can be a limiter, but sure. um, but I think it's important. This isn't a conversation I would usually have at a bar, but I think it's important to have you know something that you can find peace in. Sometimes it'll it'll just be as simple as like actively dedicating you know, a half an hour, 45 minutes, just preparing lunch and, and mm-hmm. eating something healthy uh, mm. that helps as well. But, yes. um, but sometimes it's, it's, it's drinking a beer and calling my friend Harrison and, and saying right. like, man, what are we, what are we talking about on the next episode? <laughs> That's a good segue. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So next week we're getting close to the end of beer 101. The next episode we're going to feature uh, packaging. Talk about that. Uh, and we're looking for stove pipe cans. We're going to drink one, uh, a beer that's in a stove pipe can. So if you have one you love, hit us up on Twitter at That Beer Podcast. Let us know. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for it. But kind of, yeah, that's always a fun packaging style. That also excuse to drink more beer. So <laughs> win win. Uh, but packaging is how we're going to finish up, uh, yeah, or get almost finish up Beer 101 um, next week. And that's it, guys. You made it. Uh, As a reminder, this episode was brought to you by Untapped and the Untapped store. Use the coupon code PODCAST to get 20% off your next purchase. 
at the Untapped merch store. The notes for this show are going to be available at podcast.untapped.com. And check that website out if you haven't in a while. Greg, the founder, has kind of rebuilt and rebranded it. It's beautiful. Um, if you have any questions or feedback, you can connect with Untapped on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can connect directly with Harrison and I on Twitter at That Beer Podcast. Uh, otherwise, we'll be looking forward to catching up with you next week. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Oh, I missed the camera again. <laughs> uh, cheers anyway. <laughs>